Uh, my name is Jessica Andino and I'm the chair of the City of Iowa City Human Rights Commission and it's my pleasure to welcome each one of you here today for the 37th annual awards ceremony. Uh, the commission holds this ceremony in order to showcase great human rights work that is occurring in our community, but due to the current pandemic that we all are well aware of, uh, we were unable to hold this event in person last year. With the continuing effects of the pandemic, even this year, we hold this in-person ceremony with only the nominators, honorees, their families, friends, and other close allies. As a reference point, the City Human Rights Commission was established on August 20th of 1963. It was an intentional effort by the City Council then to address housing discrimination against persons of color. A year later, the Iowa City City Council had implemented their first fair housing laws. 58 years later, as we as a commission and a community continue to fight against discrimination, inequities, and injustices in our community. The current other members of the Human Rights Commission are, and each one of you please come forward when I read your name, Vice Chair Jason Glass, Adil Adams, Siri Brune, Ashley Lindley, I'll slow down, Mark Priest, Roger Lusala, Biju Maliavo, and Tony Simpapanthanath, and myself. So close, so close. And I'm gonna ask that each one of you get a little bit of a round of applause in their acknowledgement for this morning. And you may return to your seats, thank you. <laughs> um, in addition to this, uh, to the very distinguished group of honorees we are recognizing here this morning, we also have us with us some elected officials and staff from the city of Iowa City, so thank you for joining us this morning as well. On behalf of the commission, I offer our thanks to each one of you who have took the time to join us here this morning to, and to virtually support us in the annual awards program that honors the selfless acts by human rights defenders. Your support is much appreciated. In closing, I would like to acknowledge that we meet here today in the community of Iowa City, which now occupies the homelands of Native Americans, nations, who we owe our commitment and dedication. The area of Iowa City was the homelands of the Iowa, Meskwaki, and Sauk. And because the history is complex and the time goes far back beyond memory, we acknowledge the ancient connections of many other indigenous peoples here. The history of broken treaties and forced removal that de depossessed indigenous peoples of their homelands was and is an act of colonization and genocide that we cannot erase. We implore Iowa City and our community to commit to understanding and addressing these injustices as we work towards equity, restoration, and reparations. Thank you. Vice Chair Glass, will you please come forward to award our distinguished honorees? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jason Glass. Uh, I'm Vice Chair of the Human Rights Commission, and it is my honor to present the awards to seven very deserving honorees. I get the fun job of announcing publicly how awesome they are and how much their work is appreciated. Uh, there is certainly a lot in the world that can tear us down uh, and tempt us to tear each other down, but there is far more power in choosing to lift up the people and accomplishments that strengthen us and make our communities better. These awards highlight some people and organizations that have done that in a particularly special way. Let them and their work be an example for us in the struggle to make positive change. Our first recipient is Sarah Barron, director of the Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition, receiving the Linda Severson Award that recognizes the outstanding contributions to human rights by an individual in a service organization. During the past 18 to 20 months of the pandemic, Sarah has fought to ensure some of our most vulnerable neighbors were able to keep water, their water on and a roof over their head. She led the charge in petitioning city council to put a halt to water shutdowns that were taking place during the pandemic. She ensured that community members had vital information regarding rental and mortgage assistance by hosting community meetings and sharing information with various community groups. Sarah continues to raise funding for the Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition through their yearly membership drive to have funds needed to help families that don't have endless resources. In all this work, Sarah stays in the shadows and ensures that the focus stays on the issues at hand. As, the nom as her nominator wrote, this award is the community's way for thanking Sarah for her dedication over the years. Please congratulate Sarah with your applause.
few minutes to say a few things. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, Jessica warned me I need to keep this short. I told her I was told I have five minutes, <laughs> so, <clears throat> which is two minutes longer than a public comment at a city council meeting, so I'm going to take full advantage. Um, I want to start by um, thanking the people who make it possible for us to do our work every day. Um, the members of the Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition and all the people who support and lead our organization. Um, I have my past president, John McKinstry, here, who was instrumental over the last two years in making sure that we were doing the work that needed to be done in the community. Um, when I told my parents I was thinking about what to say, my dad said, thank your dad. Um, they're watching via <laughs> Zoom, so I'd like to thank all four of my parents for helping to raise someone who um, can do the work that I do every day. Um, but now I want to switch um, to talking a little bit about human rights. Um, so who here agrees with me that housing is a human right? Okay, everyone at home, you better have your hands up too. Um, and I just want to think a little bit about what that means, okay? A human right, it means that all of us deserve, by just having been born into this human community, the right to have a safe place to call home, the right to have shelter, um, from the outdoors, the right to have a place to put our feet up every night. I believe that housing is a human right. Um, and to my mind, human rights are not something that we aspire to. They're something that we defend vigorously. In other words, it's not just a good idea that everyone should have housing. It's a right that every person has right now today and it's a right that we're falling short of. Um, during the pandemic, we saw how mobilizing as a community and investing government and private resources into housing makes a difference in keeping people's right preserved and protected. And when the pandemic is over, someday, um, we need to keep and expand that commitment, right? so that we can truly say that housing is a human right that Iowa City defends and protects every day with every resource at our disposal. Not just something we aspire to or something we think would be a good idea, but something that we must ensure for every single person in Iowa City and Johnson County and beyond. So there's never a time when someone should get their water turned off if they're not able to pay. There's never a time that someone should be on the street because they can't afford their housing. If we all raised our hand and said housing is a human right, then we have a commitment as people who are supporters of human rights to ensure that that happens every single day. Um, and I've done my small piece of that. Um, I do this work because I believe we can do that. And I want each of you to leave here today thinking more about how you can join in preserving that right alongside all of us. So thank you. The 2021 International Award goes to Dr. Emily Sinwell and David Goodner with the Iowa City Catholic Worker House. The International Award was established in 1998 to recognize the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Human Rights. The award acknowledges significant contributions to human rights in the global community. The work that Emily and David offer to the community of Iowa City is outstanding. At the Iowa City Catholic Worker House, they provide shelter, help, and food to persons who are homeless, poor, or both, including access to the free little pantry, monthly rent assistance, protective accompaniment, and deportation defense to undocumented workers, and immigrant families to help them stay in their own homes. The love, compassion, and commitment that Emily and David provide to help the needs of the people living in this community in disadvantaged conditions should be celebrated, duplicated, and followed. Emily and David fight for the human rights of, and for, for many here in Iowa City, Please help me in congratulating Dr. Emily Sinwell and David Goodner of the Iowa City Catholic Worker House. Good morning. 
The aim of the Catholic Worker Movement is to live in accordance with the justice and charity of Jesus Christ. Our sources are the Hebrew and Greek scriptures as handed down in the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. With our inspiration coming from the lives of the saints, men and women outstanding in holiness, living witness to your unchanging love. This aim requires us to begin living in a different way. We recall the words of our founders, Dorothy Day, who said, God meant things to be much easier than we have made them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Peter Moran, who wanted to build a society where it is easier for people to be good. The Catholic worker believes in the gentle personalism of traditional Catholicism. The Catholic worker believes in the personal obligation of looking after the needs of our brothers and sisters. The Catholic worker believes in the daily practice of the works of mercy. The Catholic worker believes in the houses of hospitality for the immediate relief of those who are in need. The Catholic worker believes in the establishment of farming communes where each one works according to his ability and gets according to his need. The Catholic worker believes in creating a new society within the shell of the old, with the philosophy of the new, which is not a new philosophy, but a very old philosophy, a philosophy so old that it looks like new. This year, the Catholic worker helped more than 60 refugee families cross the U.S.-Mexican border to rebuild their lives in Iowa and across the U.S., and we are working with several Afghanistan families to bring them here with, within the end of the year. So we want to thank Miriam Avila for nominating us for this award and the Human Rights Commission for recognizing our ministry. City bodies like the Human Rights Commission and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission represent all the best that city government has to offer. Thank you for your tireless work and enduring advocacy. What the city is currently doing to the TRC is an affront to its express commitment to human rights. Although we have always believed the city's sole purpose in establishing the TRC was to slow down and stall out demands for racial justice, the TRC commissioners themselves apparently never got that memo because they've shown up over the last year ready to work even after the deck was stacked against them. So we call on the city of Iowa City to stop interfering with the TRC's mandate and to let the commissioners do the work they were called on to do. We accept this award today on behalf of the entire Catholic worker community, including the deanery's Catholic parishes and lay people. Catholic social teaching on the dignity of the person is the foundation of human rights, especially as it pertains to the rights of workers, immigrants, refugees, the poor, and the climate. In that sense, all thanks and praise is due to God. Excluded immigrant workers are the ones who truly deserve this award. If Iowa City and Johnson County can't pass an excluded workers fund without barriers or restrictions, then these awards are just pieces of plastic and not worth all the pomp and ceremony. Handing out awards is easy. Actually making the investments necessary to improve the human rights situation for our most marginalized community members is much harder but it shouldn't have to be. To quote one of our members, Anita, who last week was actually denied her human right to read her handwritten letter during the Johnson County Supervisor meeting. Quote, I want to let you know that immigrants know how to work with our hands and our backs. I say backs because I remember the words of the journalist Ruben Languas. 20 years ago, he was making documentaries about immigrants and he said that we no longer uh, we were no longer just wet backs, but also bent backs, because he saw how many hours the workers remained with their backs bent doing various jobs, and how little by little they had to go straightening for the time that they were crouched. And it was very clear to him that immigrants are the structural backbone of the United States. I would like you to ask yourself, in what position would a body be found if its spine is damaged? We have the ability to use our brains as well as our bodies. You can ask all the immigrant workers who have fought for this. Ask us, and it is our feeling that the money should be awarded directly to the people with the assistance of no one else but the Funded Excluded Workers Coalition. And if the government wants to work together with us, we agree." End quote. In closing, we echo the demands of Anita and all the excluded workers and call on Iowa City and Johnson County officials to put some real teeth behind their express commitment to human rights and pass a fully funded excluded workers fund now. Lastly, we wanna thank our parents, friends, and family, especially our sons, Henry and Emiliano. You all have sacrificed so much to make this work possible. So in addition to the excluded workers and the Catholic worker community, we dedicate this award to you. Thank you.
The recipients of the Bill Reagan Community Award for 2021 are the staff of the Iowa City's Kirkwood Community College Student Services. The COVID-19 pandemic has exasperated many of the challenges faced, faced by students of diverse backgrounds. In response to the new obstacles uh, students faced, Kirkwood staff shifted its resources and opened up a food pantry, created the transportation program, and expanded their free laptop program. The Kirkwood Iowa City Food Pantry opened its doors in January of 2021. The mission is to fight food insecurity by providing nutritious and culturally diverse food to Kirkwood Iowa City students in need. Since opening its doors, they have distributed over 37,000 pounds of food and had over 900 visits. The 380 Express Bus Programs, uh, excuse me, the 380 Express Bus Programs launched at the start of the fall 2021 term uh, provides access to education for place-bound students with transportation to career and technical programs at the Cedar Rapids campus. To present, approximately 60 students have been able to take advantage of this program. In addition, in the fall of 2019, Kirkwood Student Services Iowa City created the infrastructure for a free laptop program. This was in direct response to a student who was doing her homework on her cell phone in the Kirkwood parking lot in order to access the internet. In collaboration with Kirkwood's IT department and external partners, they have given nearly 1,000 laptops and bags to students and distributed over 40 hotspots. Food and access to education are human rights. The staff within Kirkwood Community College Iowa City Student Services Department is committed to continuing to provide services that positively impact human rights on their campus and in this community. Please join me in welcoming the staff of the Kirkwood Community College Iowa City Student Services and congratulate them for this award. Forgive me, I recognized at 10 o'clock last night that I don't have a printer at home, so I uh, put my remarks on the phone. Um, good morning, my name is Nick Borders. I'm the Director of Student Services on Kirkwood's Iowa City campus. Um, I'd like to thank the City of Iowa City and the Human Rights Commission for this prestigious honor. Part of the mission of community colleges and Kirkwood specifically is to provide access to education. For so many in our community, we are the only access point to higher education and a better life for students and their families. At Kirkwood, we consider access to education a human right. When the pandemic arrived, we established a laptop program to help our, our low-income students to continue learning. As a result, nearly 1,000 Kirkwood students now have a laptop. In January of this year, we launched a food pantry to the Kirkwood community, and we've now distributed over 40,000 pounds of food. Most recently, we partnered with 380 Express to establish free transportation to Cedar Rapids for our place-bound students that are interested in career and technical education programs. I'd like to thank the Kirkwood Foundation, the Cabinet, and specifically John Boozy, our Vice President of Student Services. John inspires those in his divisions to dream big and resolve problems for our students. Without their support, the programs we've created would not be possible. Excuse me. I'd also like to thank the members of my team, some of, some of which are here today. They do the heavy lifting on a daily basis, um, and it's important that you're recognized. Lastly, I need to acknowledge the students. The past 19 months have been challenging, to say the least. Students, I admire your strength and resiliency during uncertain times to persevere and achieve your educational goals. At Kirkwood, we get to help light that path. We're in the business of building futures. And how cool is that work? Thank you. Our next award is the Rick Graff Award. Tracy John Sargent was selected for this award due to his long-term commitment to a specific cause for the benefit of a specific group. Tracy, as the founder and chair of the Multicultural Development Center of Iowa, has spearheaded numerous projects that have a direct impact on the Iowa City community and beyond. When speaking to him, it is easy to tell he has such a passion for both racial justice and representation in STEM. He has created projects to introduce fun and engaging STEM projects to underrepresented youth. The kids who participated are so excited to learn more, and you can tell it sparks an interest in something they may not have, may not have had access to otherwise. 
Tracy has started a business incubator program for minority-owned businesses and entrepreneurs, BIPOC business accelerator program at the Kingdom Center, and is finding innovative ways to make the program applicable for, and valuable for the participants. These projects are just a few of the many he has been involved in. But the common th thread throughout all of his work is a focus on racial justice and representation. He has a way of calling people in and encouraging them to use their voice and privilege in a way that they can. Tracy pushes people to think differently about what a commitment to racial justice looks like and has encouraged others to use their voice and privilege to advance equity for all. Let us welcome Tracy to come up and, and, and receive his award uh, and give him a round of applause. I really don't like doing this. I don't like being in the spotlight. I don't like uh, the acknowledgement. Uh, you mentioned being in the shadows and I'm very comfortable there. That being said, I'd be remiss not to take this opportunity to obviously thank the people that make it possible. My family, none of this happens without them. My wife, Stephanie, my daughter, Maya, our other two daughters are the ones that pick up the slack so that I can do what I do every day. Um, most of you may not know that I actually have a full-time job. I work 45 to 50 hours a week as a cybersecurity engineer, in addition to doing what I do for MDC Iowa. That's not possible without having a support staff, without having allies in the community to make this kind of work happen. Uh, the city has been an amazing partner. I want to specifically thank Jeff Fruin, who has been, you know, a, a, a my Sherpa, I guess, really. He's helped guide me through and navigate uh, the ecosystem that I'm just not familiar with. Uh, Mayor Teague has been incredible, uh, and he's helped point me in the right direction, helped make connections uh, to receive additional funding. When we started four years ago, we were completely self-funded, uh, which meant I took my extra money from my day job and put it into MDC Iowa. But it's the level of commitment that my family and I have to make sure that racial equity is a real thing. I absolutely appreciate what Kirkwood does. We like to think we're the pre-Kirkwood. Uh, we can get kids excited about STEM and create opportunities for them so that when they do get out of college or out of high school, they have an opportunity to go to a community college or to a university. Um, I believe that representation matters, and it's one of the reasons why I maintain my full-time job as a cybersecurity engineer. People of color cannot be what they cannot see, so it's important that they at least have some local examples of what that looks like. Um, I know I'm forgetting some people. Oh, my amazing sister-in-law, Holly, who um, has helped us expand and uh, helped us get into the Waterloo market. Uh, I believe she's one of the people that nominated me. She's amazing. Uh, she embodies what it is to be an ally. So if you look for examples, you don't have to look any further than that. Uh, I did want to make sure that everyone understood that in addition to the accelerator that Jason mentioned, that we do programming on a regular basis. This is all hands-on learning, which I think is the best way for kids to learn. But the challenge is scalability, right? So I love being the one there to teach children, um, and I think it's great that they see me, but I need help. So if anyone has a passion for helping this next generation, you don't have to be a STEM professional. I believe that STEM is a vehicle that everyone can use to solve the world's problems, but the problem I have is resources. So this is a shameless plug for some help, <laughs> some volunteers uh, to step up and to find a way to get involved. Uh, we opened up our learning center at the Kingdom Center, uh, and we also are opening our innovation lab. Uh, and these have been possible through amazing partnerships uh, with organizations like the Iowa City Bike Library, who graciously gave up half of their space in their new building so that we could open up essentially a maker space. Uh, we have community partners like Estique Planning that allow us to expand what we do and find creative ways to introduce STEM in things like you know the um, community, things like the uh, economic development and um, uh, climate change. So we're always looking for ways to partner, but first and foremost, we're gonna need some help. We need some resources. So that being said, thank you very much. Thank you to the commission for the award. And thank you all for being here this morning. Our final award is presented to Brian Finley, who is receiving the 2021 Kenneth Camille Award. If his name sounds familiar, it's because Brian Finley is the person who created an algorithm and published it on 
Iowa vaccine alert uh, at, twi on, at Twitter that made finding a vaccine simple for thousands of frustrated, frightened people. He streamlined a process that was otherwise very confusing and messy. Countless Iowans were able to find a vaccine appointment using his Twitter account in a time when everything has felt so chaotic and like all the systems we're supposed to be able to rely on are faltering. Brian used his acumen to save thousands of lives. If you ask Brian, he will say he's just a computer nerd with a conscience, but to the commission and to many other Iowa Cityans, he's a hero and deserves every honor bestowed upon him. Like Kenneth Camille, Brian's cre creation of the Twitter alert pr prompted, excuse me, promoted a more just world and community. Brian, please come forward and let's all congratulate him for his work. Hi, um, I have a printer, but I just don't write speeches. So, um, uh, first off, I want to just uh, thank um, a couple of people. Obviously, my wife Carolyn, who's uh, helped so much on multiple fronts. She's a nurse at the Children's Hospital. She's caught it there. She has to deal with me at home, which is a deal. She's got. Uh, we've got two kids, um, and as I put in hours off work time um, doing this, she stepped up and and uh, and was a really big help there. Um, I also want to thank, obviously, the healthcare workers, doctors, pharmacists, nurses, um, the traveling nurses that went around and, and gave all these shots and stuff at, uh, at, at clinics and things. I want to thank um, the local government. Um, thank you, Mayor T, for trying to uh, make policies and changes here that, uh, while maybe stymied, I, I feel like led to positive in the, in the end, um, especially now that my kid can wear a mask at school. That's fun. Um, uh, there are a lot of people that online have really been supportive and helpful um, during the pandemic. Uh, I want to call a few of those out. Sarah Ann Willett runs the um, COVID data tracker, I believe is the name of it. She uh, spends countless hours. Um, I, I never see a time when she's not scraping data to aggregate and provide an easily accessible way for data to uh, be accessed about the pandemic data that uh, state governments uh, as well as the federal government has made difficult to access in um, certain ways. And so it, um, I really feel like her data has helped inform a lot of choices, uh, both at government, city, state levels, that kind of thing. Um, Dr. Boonstra always seems to be retweeting and, and calling out disinformation, spreading positive information, um, uh, as well as uh, Laura Bellin of Bleeding Heartland, who is always trying to um, you know, uh, hold particularly government officials um, and, and uh, public officials accountable for their words, um, a lot of which has had to do with the pandemic lately. Todd Brady, um, who alongside me, I made a Twitter account, he made a map. Um, he, he wrote, uh, I think it's called Vaccine Hunter and now Test Hunter um, as a way for people to search and find the um, appointments uh, around them in a, in a map-based situation, which is a lot more applicable now, um, especially as we ramp up toward hopefully kid vaccinations next week. Um, all of the local news outlets that have reached out and helped spread the word about what I was doing, uh, Iowa Public Radio, all the, the local TV stations, some regional stuff as well, that was great. Um, but uh, the, the Twitter account ended up with about 35,000 followers at its height, and um, it, it was great to get that, but it was almost more exciting to see all the, the help in the, um, in the mentions, in the DMs and things. There were uh, groups of dozens of different folks that were um, finding folks that were still having trouble getting through the forms. They weren't always easy, um, especially as the appointments got snatched up quickly. And so uh, folks would take down information on behalf of others and just sit at their computers all day, whether they were work from home, stay at home parents, doing it in their free time, however it might have been, um, and registering hundreds and, and sometimes thousands of people for these appointments. A lot of those folks were um, older. Uh, they were folks that didn't have access to technology, that, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, in terms of why I decided to do this, it was, it was just easy, um, easy decision. My, uh, on March 8th, when the sort of secondary conditions opened up, I was having trouble finding an appointment for myself as well as my mom. Um, and so I kind of dug into the code and figured out how it was working in the back end. At the time, hy V you could only search within 10 miles of a given zip code. Um, so, you know, even if you were asking for an address in Iowa City, you wouldn't see appointments in North Liberty. So that's... Um, that was a little frustrating. Figured out how to get a list of all the appointments uh, across the state at Hy-Vee and it kind of snowballed from there. 
Um, I talked to hy V. I I want to thank them too. They didn't shut me out. <laughs> they, uh, I got an email from them one day from their lead pharmacy engineer uh, asking if we could have a Zoom meeting. And I was like, oh no, is this, is this where it ends? Is it, did I figure out what I was doing? And no, they just wanted to, to make sure, um, A, figure out how I was getting access, B, figure out if there were, <laughs> if there were other things they could do to help. Um, and then we just sort of agreed on kind of good network practices, which were um, obviously being observed anyway. Um, you know, uh, uh, but then after I got my appointment, it, it felt like it would be, it felt icky. It felt wrong to just kind of turn that off. And so I um, started doing the scanning and then every time a new appointment would come up available, it would tweet that out. Um, and uh, one of the things that came up pretty quickly, that all started on a Wednesday and on Friday, I nearly shut the whole thing down um, just because I had several folks bring up in messages, was this a net positive? Um, were there people that could no longer get access to appointments in tiny towns? We had a lot of people driving across uh, across the state to towns that, how do we put this nicely, were not on board with science. Um, and so I, in talking, I talked that evening with um, some pharmacists, some doctors, anybody who I could reach out to in DMs or on social media. Uh, I talked to my therapist and figured out um, to really just try to, to focus on um, you know, you've got your appointment, let's try to reach out and find somebody else that you can help, whether it's, um, you know, somebody at your work that may not be, you know, as technically literate, your aunts, your grandma, your family, um, the, you know, the old lady down the street that always is working on her lawn, like wh whoever you feel like might need some help, reach out, see what you can do. And um, uh, after turning the focus to that, it, it pretty quickly was obvious that this was the right call. Um, along with all the people in the mentions, um, just helping other people. Um, there was a lot of monetary support that, that people were trying to give me. Um, uh, all told, out of pocket, it maybe only cost $200. As it was ramping up, it started to get a little uh, big, and so I um, hesitantly reached out and said, hey, I have a, a little bit of server cost. If there's anybody that's able to help donate um, to cover that, that'd be great. It's a couple hundred bucks. Um, I put my Venmo up on Twitter, and 10 minutes later, people had sent me $2,000. <laughs> um, so I quickly shut that down, deleted the tweet, told everybody to stop, uh, and uh, paid my server bills, and then split the remaining up between 10 other uh, charities across the state of Iowa, one of which was MDC. Um, uh, MDC, NAM it wasn't just COVID stuff. MDC, NAMI, um, uh, I can't remember the list. It's on Twitter somewhere. Uh, and, and so that was great to, to not only be able to impact COVID stuff, but also beyond that. Um, uh, Ray Gunn reached out and wanted to find a, a way to recognize what I was doing and help support charities. And uh, we came up with the idea of a shirt call that, that said, be a helper. I had a woman reach out to me um, that uh, pretty early on in the Twitter account that said, she had shown her daughter uh, my Twitter account. She was pretty nervous about the pandemic and worried about what was going on and um, showed my Twitter account to her as an example of the, the old Fred Rogers, when things get scary, look for the helpers. Um, and, and you know, I feel like I was a helper, but obviously everybody in the mentions, everybody around the community, those are the helpers as well. And so uh, profits, proceeds from those shirts went to uh, the United Way of East Central and Central Iowa, as well as uh, the Iowa Public Health Association. I think we were able to raise somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,200 there. Um, and above and beyond that, people still kept trying to give me money, and so I pointed them to a charity fundraiser I do for the Children's Hospital every year um, called Extra Life. It's kind of like Dance Marathon, but instead of dancing for 24 hours, because I'm not capable of that, uh, I play video games for 24 hours. <laughs> um, and they've, uh, just from the folks on the Twitter account, gave uh, close to $5,000 to that so far. Um, the marathon's next weekend, actually, so. Uh, closing in on 10,000 raised total. Uh, a big por portion of that came from um, Rob Sand and his wife, Christine. They made a, a big contribution to kind of get that going, and that was great. Um, so yeah, the, the award's cool. I'm glad we're making progress, but um, this, this really kind of goes out to the almost 7,000 people in the state that have died from COVID. Um, you know, I wish we could have done more. I wish people in power could have done more. Um, and that's frustrating, but uh, on the positive side, it sounds like within the next week and a half, two weeks, we'll be getting kid shots, five to 11. Uh, my son is really excited. It's the only shot he's ever been excited to take. Um, 
he, he's really frustrated that he can't go to the Heartlanders games yet because he doesn't have a shot, and we're, um, we're, we're really excited for that too. So, um, so yeah, I think I'm done now. Uh, thank you for the commission for recognizing me, and uh, have a good evening. Jima, are you here? Oh, great. Yeah. So there's a little bit more. I was, I was, so we have to get an encore. Our final recipient is Jema Ledral, who is receiving the Isabel Turner Award for her volunteer service to the community. Jema recently retired from the Iowa City Free Lunch Program. From 2014 uh, to July 30th of 2021, she was the Free Lunch Program Director of Volunteers. The Free Lunch Program is one of the quiet services in the Iowa City area that strives to do one thing well, provide a free, filling, and healthy lunch to anyone who comes to them. Lunch is served by teams of dedicated volunteers Monday through Saturday from noon to 1 p.m., and over 38,000 meals are served each year. For the past seven years, JAMA has managed the kitchen and volunteers at the free lunch program, spending six days a week on, on site to ensure that services are delivered smoothly. The guests at the free lunch program recognize her care and dedication. They know JAMA is a friend and an advocate. The volunteer groups who serve at the free lunch program come from 35 organizations in the community. Jema has been the keystone organizer of that enormous group effort throughout her tenure at free lunch. She has been an integral worker in addressing food insecurity in Iowa City and providing hospitality to all members of our community. Please help me in giving Jema a warm round of applause for this very well deserved award. Well, as if there wasn't enough pressure for someone who also likes to remain very much in the shadows. I'm the encore, oh my. Um, <laughs> I too have some notes just to keep myself on track. Um, first, I want to thank Diane Platt for nominating me. Diane was an AmeriCorps volunteer with us uh, during COVID, which was a crazy time. Um, but she did a great job and then was willing to take on my role um, so that I could step down, um, which I'm also grateful for. <laughs> Um, I'm very honored to receive the award. I'm quite humbled uh, when I looked at the list of previous recipients of this award and the other awards that the commission gives. I was just in awe and awe of so much that so many people in our community do um, for others. Uh, the knowledge, dedication, and heart that the people who lead these organizations have is just amazing to me. Um, I appreciate the City of Iowa City for uh, sponsoring these awards. I think it's really good that everyone is reminded of the good in our world right now because we lose sight of that. I know I, know I do at times, um, so I appreciate that. Um, I also have to give credit where credit is due uh, to all those volunteers at free lunch. Prior to the pandemic, someone had tried to count up the unique individuals that served over a year, and there were over 900 names on that list. So that's a lot of people that come and volunteer with our program. Um, also, my predecessors are boards of directors. Without their support, particularly during COVID, I couldn't have done the things that I did. Um, working with a free lunch program, first as a volunteer, um, and then as director, wasn't something I ever really planned. I just kind of fell into it. I, I didn't train for this. I didn't go to school for this. I don't have a degree in this. I just, I started volunteering. I enjoyed it. The opening came um, and I took the job. I was pretty sure I could coordinate everything. That's, that's one of my strengths. I can coordinate this. I can handle this. What, what I hadn't expected was how much the guests, and that's a key piece of free lunch, is that the people who come to eat, our diners, are our guests. They're not our patrons. Um, they're not our clients. They're our guests. And I was really surprised um, by how much they touched my heart in just a short amount of time. Because like I said, my focus was on, oh, I, can, I can organize this. I got this. No problem. Um, but I, I learned a lot from those guests over the years, uh, a lot about humility, um, perseverance, and community. Um, I learned that community takes on a lot of different forms. And for some of the folks that ate on a regular basis, the little two hours of coming to free lunch, that, that was their community for the day. Um, you know, and they, they look, looked out for each other and for others. Um, so my first thought on learning that I received this award was that 
I didn't do anything big. I, I really just kind of showed up every day. And I think maybe that speaks to that it really can be the little things in life that, that make a big deal and, and make a di big difference to everyone. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, on behalf of the Iowa City Human Rights Commission, I want to congratulate all of today's winners. And I invite Chair Andino back to the podium to make her closing remarks. So on behalf of the Human Rights Commission, we'd like to thank all of you attending in person or online today. Um, we would also like to thank the 2021 honorees. Your contributions make this community and this world a better place. I also want to take a moment to say thank you to the wonderful Stephanie Bowers, because without her, none of this would be possible. Please remember, uh, this program is being recorded and will be available for viewing um, in the near future on Channel City, uh, Channel 4. And if you're interested in serving with us on the Human Rights Commission, we currently have three vacancies open. Uh, that will be at the starting term of January 2022. You can apply uh, via the city's website, which is icgov.org, and applications are due by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, November 9th. Stephanie has a few handouts um, on her table back there as well that have a little bit more information and a couple other free handouts as well. Um, I'm going to ask that the award recipients also stay right after I give the closing remarks. Don't run away. You get to take some lovely photos. Um, but once again, thank you all and have a wonderful Wednesday. <coughs>